Hello and welcome back to the Skype Sessions. I'm David and today I'm going to be speaking to the managing editor of the Christian History magazine because they have an episode coming out very shortly which I think you're all going to be very interested in. So Jennifer Woodruff Tate, welcome to the show. Yeah, very nice to be here. So would you mind telling us a little bit about your own background before we get on to talking about the magazine? So I, I've been the, the managing editor of the magazine since 2012. Um, I I went to school a lot trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I, am, I am currently, in addition to uh, working for the magazine, an Episcopal priest. Um, I'm also married and have two kids. And uh, I have degrees in theology, library science, and American church history. <laughs> Which, which adds up to knowing the answer to a lot of Jeopardy questions. <laughs> <laughs> a a one-woman Google. Exactly. <laughs> and you, as I said before, you working as the managing editor for the Christian History magazine. What's the background to this magazine? What were its origins and goals? So it was founded, well, close to 40 years ago. Our 40th anniversary is actually next year uh, by a man named Kenneth Curtis, who uh, is now going to be with Jesus, but at that point was... Um, the owner and manager of a vision video, the Christian video company, which still exists. And they were producing some videos that had to do with church historical figures. And he was also very concerned for evangelicals getting up to speed on the history between Jesus and now, um, or maybe Jesus Luther and now, but you know, that, that was sort of it. <laughs> and, and so he thought that it would be a good idea to publish a magazine that originally was meant to be companions to the videos and it took a couple of years for it to you know get a regular publishing schedule that would focus on eras or people or movements uh in christian history and so it's the, every issue has always focused on a person or theme um or you know, or movement it's it's not like we have a little bit on this and a little bit on this it always sort of zooms in the first 24 issues uh he published and then he sold the magazine to christianity today which published it for a number of years and then Christianity Today, uh, in after the big economic downturn in 2008, decided that they, they could no longer afford to publish the magazine. When that happened, the rights reverted to the original publisher. And so Christian History Institute, my employer, took it back um, and began publishing with issue 101. And the issue I'm on here to talk about uh, is, is issue uh, 140. So uh, we've obviously not been doing this for about eight years. Mm. And you also work with one of the former guests of our show, Chris Armstrong. Yes, Chris is the senior editor, which means, as he says, that he gets to sit in on planning meetings and then watch other people run around and do all the work, <laughs> including me. Oh, so. <laughs> that's the ideal job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And so how many issues do you generally produce a year? Four. Uh, well, on occasion, we've done five. Uh, when we do that, we call it a bonus issue because we don't raise the subscription price. Um, but normally it's a quarterly. Okay. Now, your latest edition is called Jack at Home, and you've had a couple of episodes, a couple of episodes, podcast world, you've had a couple of issues uh, on C.S. Lewis before. So what was it that made you want to return to him and this subject? Well, honestly, uh, several of the, issue, the issues that we've done on him were uh, are quite old. One was done the first time Christian History Institute had the magazine. One was done when it was at Christianity Today. They were both excellent issues. Um, and then we had done one on the seven sages, which are basically the seven authors studied at the Wade. As they're not all inklings, we spent a long time coming up with that title. So they're now the seven sages <laughs> to me. And we covered Lewis in that. But we kept getting people writing in saying, I want to read an issue on Lewis. I want to buy an issue on Lewis. And honestly, we couldn't sell them an issue on Lewis because the other ones are so old, we don't have copies that are for sale. There are archival copies, uh, a few. Uh, so we said, well, we've done a lot on C.S. Lewis, but let's do something else on C.S. Lewis. And I said, well, if we're going to do that, let's do something new. Let's do something that is not simply a rehashing of the events of his life and the main points of his thought. Because we've done that. We've done that twice. We did that really well. And so we came up with this idea that we would talk about Jack and Warney and Joy and Arthur Greaves and, and you know, Mrs. Moore and, you know, and we start and his parents and... Uh, you know, Doug Gresham, and, you know, we started just expanding it to think about the people that were in his life as a person, not playing down the more academic friendships he had that have been more studied, such as his, with Tolkien, for instance, we have a little bit on Tolkien, mm -hmm. but saying, well, what if we think of him as a brother and a husband and a stepfather and a friend, 
you know, and does, do we see him differently? Do we get to know him more as a person? Do we realize where some of the things that he thought came from? And I'm just pleased as punch with the results. So. Yeah, it, it, it definitely felt like a very personal issue. But as you say, you start digging into Lois's life and you start seeing the themes and elements of various stories and echoes that seem awfully familiar to mere Christianity, the problem of pain or grief observed. Yes, yeah, so we, we wanted, as we considered each person, we wanted to tell people more about the person because Lois fans probably know a whole lot more about Lois than I do about Arthur Graves, for instance, or, or even Joy. Mm. And but we also wanted to say, well, how, because he knew this person, you know, how was the person different, but also how was he different? What what do we have that derives from that? In some cases, as with Joy, it's really obvious, you know, without Joy, we would not have a grief observed. We might not have till we have faces. In other case, Arthur grieves. Is there a specific thing or is it simply that his friendship was such an encouragement to Lewis to produce all of Lewis's work? But we, we really wanted to think about how each of these people changed him, how he bounced ideas off of them, how their relationship altered you know, what he thought to some degree. Because hmm. there's always a big fuss made about the Inklings, and rightly so. But really, Lewis always had Inklings-like figures in his life that were encouraging him. He was bouncing ideas off them, and they were changing and shaping his thought right from the get-go. Yeah, one of the, the very interesting points that, you know, and I thought, I, we asked Hal Poe to do a womb to tomb, you know, for anybody who's picking up this magazine and has never read anything about her by C.S. Lewis before. I find it hard to believe there are such people, but in case they are out there, um, you, you know, and you're picking up, you want to know why are we devoting an issue to this guy? So Dr. Poe did this lovely article and near the end of it, when he was talking about his friendship with Roger Lancelin Green, he said, well, there were always people like that that Lewis thought out. You can sort of look back and see him, not just Tolkien, although we know about that, not just maybe, you know, Hugo Dyson or Charles Williams or, you know, but see other people who are lesser known and who perhaps became part of the Inkling circle uh, that he always wanted. He seemed to be someone who could not have an idea by himself without talking about it and wanted to find people to talk about it. And eventually, you know, eventually got married to Joy because he was talking about so many ideas with her that, you know, the, 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 might, you as know, well. <laughs> might as well. Yeah, might, 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 might as well. And, you know, and, and that, you know, how that all came out, you know, is, you know, a long story. But part of what drew them to each other was that they liked to talk about the same things, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the article on Joy and having read the whole biography that is based off of, you know, they were just really interested in the same ideas. And Lewis was always looking for people like that. Yeah. Um, and always seeming to welcome them into his circle with just this really wonderful friendship and you know, do I need to stop so you can cut this bit out? <laughs> it's good. That's my wife, Marie. She is going oh, to be giving I just, but... I, I just told my husband, don't walk through here. I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's going to be giving birth to my son in two weeks. So I have to be. Yeah, that, that's, that's extremely important. I can go back to the beginning of that sentence. If <laughs> no, you that was great. Okay. <laughs> but at any rate, he, he seems to not have been proud of his own knowledge. Hmm. I mean, he used his own knowledge, and, and I really picked that up from this issue. You know, he used his knowledge. He wasn't ashamed that he had knowledge. It, it was important to him. It was, but he really seems like anybody he talked to, whether he wrote the letters, whether he knew them, you know, like Greaves for 50 years, he just sort of like, well, we're going to just talk about stuff because I like to talk about stuff with people. Uh, and I really came away from this issue thinking of Jack Lewis as somebody above all who just loved to talk about ideas with people. And if you wanted to talk about an idea, you were his best friend in that moment. Right down to his chauffeur. Yeah, I'd heard I'd heard fun stories when he would say, "How does this sound?" And he would, he he would he would say a few sentences or a few paragraphs of what he'd been thinking about, and then get some feedback, and then think about it a little bit more, and then have another uh, go. Uh, so, oh, editing sessions as he was driving to work, which is a wonderful idea. Now, you mentioned Hal Poe earlier, uh, former guest of the show, and actually, as I looked through the table of contents of the magazine, I saw lots of former guests of our show, Crystal Hurd, Diana pavlak Geyer, David Downing, and uh, even my own co-host, Andrew Lazo. So, you know, you were clearly scraping the bottom <laughs> of the barrel near the end, but that's, that, that's, that's okay. Uh, but what can readers expect to find within the pages of this particular issue? So, first of all, there is, as I said, this, you know, if you have never read Lewis before, we want you to know who this guy is before you proceed further. So, fairly lengthy biographical article. Article, and then the one by your co-host is basically a 
not quite an annotated bibliography, but close. Like if you're go like dividing Lewis's work into categories and saying if you're going to experience each of these categories, if you want to experience his fiction, his apologetics, his literary criticism, where should you start and where might you go on? Uh, so the first six, 15, 16 pages of the issue were devoted to this is the guy, you know, if you've never heard of him before, this is why the rest of us are in love with him. And, you know, this is what you should read. Um, you know, and I strongly encourage people. I mean, anything we wrote about Lewis is not half as good as anything he wrote because he was such a darn good writer. So, you know, go and read Lewis. But then after that, it goes basically chronologically, um, which, I mean, people like Arthur Greaves or his brother that he knew his whole life, where are you going to fit them? But, you know, it starts with his parents and his, and his grandparents and cousins and aunts and a lot of the people that appear in Surprised by Joy. And that's all you know about them. Well, now you know more about them. And you got Crystal Hurd to do some of that. And she's got a book coming out where we're going we're gonna to know everything we ever wanted to know about the Lewis family. Yeah, and they were all fascinating people. You know, I didn't know his grandfather baptized him until I read that article, for instance. <laughs> so there, there's that, you know, that sort of background on the family. Uh, then Arthur Greaves um, and then uh, Mrs. Moore. Uh, David Downing did a lovely short article on Mrs. Moore that tells you everything you need to know and nothing you don't, uh, which, you know, I, well, like, I, I went someone who could just handle this beautifully, and he did uh, Warney. Uh, we sort of stuck Warney in the middle, because, of course, he knew Warney for his entire life. Um, uh, now I'm now I'm getting lost on who I've mentioned and who I haven't. J Joy, obviously. Um, and then we have a uh, very long interview at the end, which Marjorie Mead of the Wade Center did with Douglas Grasham mm -hmm. about not only the stories of how he first met Jack and Warney, which, which have been heard before, but just some really beautiful thoughts about why, as the only person now living who lived with them, you know, he wants to he wants to advance the legacy. So, and, and I'm sure because I, every time I summarize what's in the issue, I leave something out. So I'm sure I left something out. And I'm <laughs> sorry if I did, uh, but it, you know, as you as you go through. You know, it sort of moves through his life and you see him, you know, sort of changing and growing and coming up with different ideas and writing different things, but always in the context of these relationships. And then we stuck all the, you know, Sayers, Williams, Tolkien, Barfield, all the, you know, sort of inklings and in what I would call more professional colleagues into the gallery. Mm -hmm. Because when we've done this before, they always get sort of pride of place. And then it's like, oh, and then there were these other. So we flipped that. Uh, so it's like, you know, obviously it's important to know about Lois that he was friends with Tolkien, and we, we have a reference to that, but we've covered it so extensively in other places. We did a whole issue on Tolkien, you know, so, you know, it's like they're here. And then we, we the last two people we talked about very briefly in that gallery were Clyde Kilby, who, of course, founded the Wade Collection, and Walter Hooper, and how they, when quite young, both encountered Lewis and then made it their life's work to promote Lewis, so... And one of the things I really loved about the magazine is throughout you have gorgeous pictures showing you who all of these people were. Because I'm sure if I said Tolkien, Lewis, everyone's got a very clear idea in their head what those men look like. But when I start going Charles Williams, Owen Barfield, Clyde Kilby, it, then it starts getting a little bit, a little bit fuzzier. Yeah, not to mention Patty Moore and, you know, Arthur Lewis's dad and, you know, so... The fact we we did this in uh, collaboration with the Wade, um, Mar Marge Mead was our uh, scholarly editor. We always have an outside person when we're doing any theme because the people on the staff are not experts in everything. I'd love to be experts in everything, but you know, and this I know more about than some other things. But um, so so Marge Mead uh, was our outside advisor, and so. We worked with her and the archivist, and the pictures that they have there are amazing. I had never seen 90% of these before they sent them over. We were in the middle of a picture meeting when all of a sudden our picture researcher said, I just checked my email and I have C.S. Lewis's baby pictures. Uh, <laughs> and we have, so we have C.S. Lewis's baby pictures in the magazine, several of them. Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, by you know, baby, but you know, sort of toddler pictures. And it just makes it very different than if you always think of him as sort of like the portly middle-aged dude with the pipe you know, writing in his study, you know, he got there by being a baby and an awkward teenager and a, a soldier. And, you know, there's a picture of him with Patty Moore sitting in a wagon. I mean, we all know Patty Moore. He died, Mrs. Moore, you know, but do we know what Patty Moore looks like? I didn't before I saw this. There's some marvelous pictures they have of Mrs. Moore when she was young as well as when she was old, uh, which gives you some impression of why Lewis was possibly fascinated by her. So the pictures are just amazing. And that is all on the way they have marvelous stuff that I, you know, I guess came from the family collections. 
Now, earlier you said you were afraid that you might have missed something out describing the magazine. And one thing that you missed out is something that I want to talk about, because you wrote uh, an article about The Four Loves, and that's the book that we're going to be doing next season. Uh, so what were, you, what were you trying to communicate in that article? Well, we didn't lean really heavily in each of the other articles on trying to assign The Four Loves, you know, to to someone. You know, do do I want to get into whether we're signing Philly or Eros to Mrs. Moore? I do not. Um, you know, or or you know, or with 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 Joy. Uh, you know, we're, 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 what do we call that? But I wanted it to be sort of known and seen that what Lewis thought about love broadly, love seen as familial love, friendship. You know, all of uh, as well. You know, Eros and and my love. That that was not in a vacuum. That was, you know, that came out of his relationships with these people. And towards the end of that article, I talked about how, you know, in the chapter on friendship, for instance, you can spot Tolkien and Williams. And he talks about when Williams died, what that did to his friendship with Tolkien. He doesn't call them that. In, in, he says, you know, Ronald and Charles. But, you know, you don't need half a brain to know that's Tolkien and Williams. Um, Although I places, totally missed yeah, it the first time I was reading it. <laughs> yeah, there are places where it's pretty obvious he's, he's talking about, uh, talking about uh, Janie Moore, for instance. You know, so... Um, and, you know, he, there's some bits that you could apply to his relationship with Joy. It, so having a deep understanding of that book and of what Lewis thought about these things, and also in that book he was trying to answer a book that he had read decades earlier about love and you know, divine and human love that he didn't like very much. And so he takes that on intellectually, but he also it also comes out of all these relationships that he'd had. And so I wanted people, if they read the rest of the magazine, to have the four loves in the back of their heads and to think that, Lewis, what Lewis thought about love informed his relationship with these people, and what Lewis thought about these people informed his relationship, you know, it, his intellectual thoughts on the matter. So, mm. so that's why that's in there. And it's just one of my favorite books, so I adored getting to write about it. I am excited and a little nervous about it, because it, I, The Four Loves was the first of Lewis's books. I mean, I had, I loved Narnia as a kid, and I had then as in my mid twenties started picking up mere Christianity, the screw tape letters and really enjoyed it. But I think the four loves was the first book that I read that really grabbed me. And I was reading it as part of a small book club. And I was texting my friend who was in, it. it's like, Oh my goodness, the next love is even better. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I'm a little nervous trying to make sure that we do it justice. Uh, and it, it, as you say, it pervades so much of his life and his relationships. Uh, I'm hoping that we're going to do a good job on it, but uh, it was it was lovely to be flicking through the uh, the electronic copy and 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 seeing the very same first edition of the Four Loves that I own. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we got we got the, a lot of the first edition book covers from the Wade. I mean, when I say they did all the images, not all all, but all, but all of the Lewis family issues um, and a lot of the book covers were there. So then we obviously went to some other sources, for instance. You know, I mean, like art houses and stuff. We have some pictures uh, from the edition of the myths that uh, Greaves and Lewis bonded over. I mean, is it from that copy? No, but but from that edition, you know, there's some beautiful color images of like you know, Brunhilde and Wotan. You know, so so we put those in. So it's like, well, this when they all got excited, like, oh, you like that kind of thing. You like that kind of thing. This is the kind of thing they were looking at. You know, mm -hmm. you know, Lou, you know, uh, William Morris, other thing. You know, so we had some some things in there so you can see not just the people but the objects and if somebody say subscribe to the christian history magazine what might they expect in some coming issues can you give us some hints of areas or topics or people that might be addressed yeah i, I can tell you about the next three issues uh because after that we're um I mean, next four. Um, at any rate, the, the next one, which I'm actually heavily working on editing right now, is the last in a series that we're calling faith and flourishing um we talked about christians um throughout history, sometimes we have one of these topical issues that does go from like Jesus to now on a particular topic. So we did one of those on science and technology. Uh, we did one on the marketplace and we did one on education, higher education. And this last one is on civic engagement, which is an incredibly broad topic because that involves everything from Abraham Kuyper being prime minister of the Netherlands to Dietrich Bonhoeffer trying to kill Hitler, you know, and so so uh, both of which we talk about in the magazine. So it's going to talk about all forms of Christian civic engagement you know, through politics, art, um, you know, oh, culture, not so much science and market because we already did that. But, you know, many of the other areas that 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 Christians have have tried to be in the world and not of it emphasis 
you know, on, in the world? How do you be in the world? Uh, Christians mm -hmm. have sometimes not had a good idea about how to do that. So we're going to talk to some, about some people who, who tried to do that and who in many cases did it well or, you know, the more I read about Bonhoeffer planning to kill Hitler, maybe did it well and then maybe didn't do it so well at the end. And anyway, many different examples. So that's coming up. The next one after that is going to be on the history of uh, Christianity and divine healing. Uh, we did an issue, many, actually one of my first issues um, that I worked on at all uh, when the magazine came back to Christian History Institute on Christians and the history of hospitals, which Christians were right in the middle of. Uh, and that's been, you know, that was a wonderful issue. And now we're going to step back and look at the first half of the magazine sort of through history, ways that Christians have talked about miraculous divine healing. And then the second half is going to be a lot of modern stuff about different countries and areas um, you know, in the 20th century, where this is where this is a hot topic. Um, so that then the issue after that, we did one earlier a couple years ago on Christianity and the uh, America Christianity and the Bible, and we talked about the Bible for the nation. You know, the influence of the Bible on the founding fathers on reform movements. This one's going to be the Bible for the church. We're going to talk about hymns and worship and Bible quizzing, which my husband spent his childhood doing, and and, and things like that. And then the the final thing I can tell you is that the issue after that will be our official 40th anniversary issue, and it's going to be 96 pages of the greatest images in Christian history. It's going to be a book, like with a binding, um, and that'll that'll be coming out just about a year from now. So wonderful. So where can people go to pick up a copy of, say, this particular episode, and where can they go to subscribe? Um, you can go to Christian History Institute. Um, and if you go there, um, and I'm sure that you'll have a way to provide that link to people uh, when you post this, uh, you'll see right there on the front page how to read the magazine and, and, uh, and see other resources that we have there and how to subscribe. Um, the deadline to get the Lewis issue by subscribing has passed, but that doesn't mean you can't get it because you can go buy a copy. Um, and if you start a subscription now, the first one that you'll get will be the, uh, the civic engagement issue. Wonderful. Well, all of the links for that will be in the show notes. Thank you very much for coming on the show and uh, talking to us about Jack and this new uh, new issue that's going to be coming out. Uh, I hope to see you on the show again uh, next time. There is something vaguely inklings, tangential, uh, so we can talk about it. Sounds good. Wonderful. And please join us next time when we're going further up and further in. Cheers. <laughs>